999ers risk their lives every day keeping us safe. My heart was racing, but you just do it because you're a police officer. But all too often, they're abused and attacked. I have been punched, kicked, spat at, sworn at. I think most of us have. These personal attacks on police, firefighters and paramedics are at an all-time high. I could feel the blood running through my shirt. He grabbed me around the throat with both his hands. Leaving them traumatised and unable to work. It's then left me questioning, is this the job that I want to carry on with? But while the violent criminals responsible are hunted down and brought to justice, our protectors fight to get well and back on the job. I'm not going to get beaten by somebody deciding they're going to try and hurt me. Ready to face the next critical incident. Stand still! Please return to show yourself! Coming up, a police officer bravely returns to work after receiving life-changing injuries in a chemical attack. Everything just went black. No sound, no sight, no hearing. A heroic police dog shows what he's really made of when a car thief makes a desperate bid to escape. Stay there! I need help! It was the first incident, really, where he was tested in terms of courage and how determined he was to protect me. And a man on roller skates wielding a kitchen knife goes on a stabbing spree on a busy street. Mental health issues in the community now are probably, is probably one of the biggest problems we have. In a risky business like law enforcement, you need to be able to count on your co-workers. It's really important to have a strong bond with your, your colleagues, the people that you're working with, because you go in to incidents, you're putting yourself in danger on a daily basis almost, and you've got to look out for each other. And that in itself builds a strong bond. In Lancashire Constabulary, officers Lee Richards, Stuart Garnett and Andy Gore have become close over their time serving on the front line. Sometimes police officers are punch bags, but we know that when we go and deal with violent people, um, unfortunately, sometimes officers do get injured. You've got to be able to trust your colleagues because you've got to have their back, but you've got to trust that they've got your back. You share some really quite exciting experiences, but also very frightening experiences, and you go through those things together. And together, they experienced a terrifying incident back in April 2019, which for one of them would be life-changing. I was working a night shift, so we started at 10 o'clock at night, due to finish at 7 in the morning. I was deployed to a Grade 1 incident from comms, where they shouted up to say that a, uh, a female had rung 999, stating that a male was trying to kill her with a knife. When he arrived at the scene, PC Stuart Garnett was told the victim had fled and was hiding nearby, so he and a colleague searched the area for her. We were looking for her shouting a name, and eventually she came out of the bushes and identified herself. The situation changed then slightly. From the information she then gave us, she just said she'd been attacked by the male and that he kicked her in the stomach. Um, she didn't have any apparent injuries, but I made the decision that I needed to arrest the male uh, at that time on suspicion of an assault. Leaving the victim with his colleague, Stuart called for backup and went to the suspect's address. Sergeant Andy Gore is first on the scene, quickly followed by PC Lee Richards. When I arrived at the scene, information was coming through all the time that the male was um, inside the address, armed with a knife. And we made the decision that we were going to force entry to the property and, and arrest him. Stuart turns on his body-worn camera as he tries to gain entry to the house. He's here. It was clear that the door had been barricaded from the other side. Go on. By the time I got the door actually open, um, we had about eight officers outside waiting to go in to arrest the male. I carried on through the property to search the downstairs room. Police officer with taser! Anyone inside, identify yourself! Andy and the rest of my colleagues have gone up the stairs to search upstairs. It was pitch black at the top of the stairs. We couldn't see anything. At that point, 
I was hit in the face with a liquid. Didn't know what it was. But Andy was sort of just in front of me on the stairs. He fell and started tumbling back down the stairs. It just hit the entire left side of my face. I went into my mouth. And then that was it. Everything just went black. Got no sound, no sight, no hearing, no smell. I've got nothing at all. What's going on? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Please, we taser! Taser officer! What's happened there? My initial thought was that somebody had been stabbed because that was the, the report that we'd had that the male initially had had a knife. And the feeling you get in that situation, it's, um, I can't describe it, um, but it makes the hairs on your neck stand up on end. I remember dropping to my knees on the stairs. I have no recollection from that point. I instantly felt a burning sensation all down the left-hand side of my face. And my first thought was, I've had acid thrown at me. Taser officer! What's happened there? You've been sprayed! Police officer, we've tased it! It's ammonia! Watch yourself, ammonia! Get some water for sight! I knew it was ammonia straight away. Um, it's a very acrid smell and it really gets into the back of the throat and makes you feel like you can't breathe. When I could smell that and I thought he's had that chucked in his face, I was uh, really concerned for Andy. I knew straight away I needed to get him to some water to get, him, to get his face washed, but it potentially a, a life-threatening situation. Get an ambulance! I was feeling frightened, worried about Andy, worried about myself. I didn't, I didn't want to touch my face because I, I had these images in my mind of my face melting off because that's, that's what it felt like. Stand by, stand by! I had my taser drawn and I was trying to call down the offender from upstairs. Stand by! Get downstairs now! Show yourself now! Get downstairs! Yeah, yeah, she's on the corner, he's got a spray can or something. I could hear him shouting, get out of my effing house. And it was clear that he wasn't gonna come down without a fight. It's a hard decision to make. Having got an officer just had ammonia thrown in the face, do I want to go upstairs and potentially have the same happen to me? But the ammonia got overpowering. Can't breathe. Can't breathe. Get out there. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go outside for a short time before going back in. I could see Andy was in a really bad way, with his head in the kitchen sink, trying to get some water to wash the liquid off him. He was coughing, spluttering, um, looked to be in incredible pain. Sort of regain some level of consciousness and awareness when I'm stood up at the sink, swilling water onto my face. <clears throat> Andy, are you all right? My main concern was the most horrendous pain in my mouth. It left my eyes, left eye was really shut very tight. Lots of pain with that. My breathing was shallow, I remember that. It was rapid. The burning in my mouth was just off the scale. Everybody was coughing, we were struggling to breathe, but we're just running on pure adrenaline. And my only thought was, I need to deal with this guy. We need to, we need to do something about this male. Stuart does a quick sweep of the downstairs and finds the chemical spray used to attack the officers. Simone, shout that up. But then... He's out! The offender escapes from an upstairs window. Which way? Drunk to your back! Later, the chase is on to catch the offender. Where is he? And Andy is afraid for his life. Pictures of my wife, pictures of my kids, thinking, is this it? Am I going to see him again? Is it just going to sink through slowly? It's going to be a long, lingering death. Assaults involving corrosive substances have more than doubled in England in the last decade. And working on the front line, police officers can be extremely vulnerable to such attacks.
This body-worn footage captures the moment Greater Manchester Police attended an address to carry out an arrest. Got oh, gas, uh, petrol, petrol is sitting out the window. But the man threw petrol out of the window directly Get at the back. officers. We need to back off. They retreated to gather protective screens and returned to the address. The man tried to attack them and then set his property alight. One officer was taken to hospital where he received treatment from an eye specialist for suspected chemical burns from the petrol. The offender was detained, arrested, and later jailed for three years and six months. Back in Lancashire, while police are attempting to arrest a man on suspicion of assault at knife point, What's going on? He has sprayed ammonia in the faces of Lee Richards and Andy Gore. It just hit the entire left side of my face. I went into my mouth. Get some water, facade! It felt like my face melting off. While Andy is struggling with severe burns, the offender has escaped from an upstairs window. He's out! Which way? Drum to him back! PC Stuart Garnett, Lee Richards and colleagues chase him down. Get that damn screw now. That's it. Where is he? Police have changed to show yourself. Hold it there. Check Lee. Lee, check there. Who's got torch, Lee? We've gone through the garden and ultimately found the offender hiding behind a bin. He was stood there and still worried about what he was going to do. Did he have any more of this liquid? He could quite, if he did, we're not that far away from him. He could throw it at us again. Due to the severity of what's just happened, um, I've made the decision to taser him. Taser officer! Get out of the now! You extend him! Go cross, go cross! So mate, I'll come out back here. Lee's tasered him at exactly the same time. Get power off now! Turn it off! <laughs> He's gone to the floor and I've moved forward and got him in handcuffs and got him detained. Yeah. What's got in his back pocket there? A nice screwdriver. Mind yourself on that screwdriver. He did have a knife in his back pocket and a screwdriver, so we did still have those weapons on him. Stop resisting now! I'm not. We've got it, we've got it. Yeah, I'm not. Get it behind your back. Melody's saying. That's one, mate. What are you doing, you back? You're under arrest on suspicion of assault. You don't have to say anything, but they are on your defence. If you do not mention one question, there's something that you later let in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence, do you understand? Oh, right. Yeah, don't worry. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. As soon as the male was handcuffed, I'm thinking, I need to sort my eye out. It just felt like my face was on fire. Meanwhile, Andy is in agonising pain, still unaware that the chemical he's been covered in and ingested is ammonia. I couldn't smell anything, couldn't taste anything. It was just pain, pain in my eye, pain in my throat. And I can remember retching constantly over the sink and bringing up mouthfuls of this thick gel. My breathing was very shallow, it was quick. Um, and then it's like probably what you you hear about on TV a thousand times. You've you've pictures of my wife, pictures of my kids, pictures of family. Thinking, is this it? Am I going to see him again? 
is whatever I've ingested, is that just going to rot through? <sighs> is it going to... Is it just going to sink through slowly? Is it going to be a long, lingering death? Or am I going to be fine? Andy needs urgent medical attention, but with no ambulance available, his colleagues race him and Lee to the nearest hospital, five miles away. The main concern was breathing, because it was coming quite heavily restricted. And I'm thinking, make it to hospital. If you can make it to hospital, you've got a fighting chance. <sighs> Sorry. Mm. You're under arrest for assault, and you've just sprayed a no noxious substance in a police officer's face while we've entered the premises for lawful duty. Sometimes officers don't like to say they're scared. You've got to be big and macho, but that, it's one of the scariest jobs I've been to. Get him in, I'm happy. We all want to go home safe at the end of the day, but it just, it brings it home to you when you're at a situation like that, um, that, you know, one of our team isn't going home. Mind your head. Andy arrived at the hospital, and a nurse immediately started treating the burns to his eye. I was telling her that I've got a strong burning in my mouth. And she told me to put my tongue out. I put my tongue out, and she stopped. The ammonia had completely destroyed the taste buds in Andy's mouth, burning his tongue and throat. He was in agony, struggling to breathe, and was rushed straight to the emergency resuscitation room. There was a team of doctors, anaesthetists, nurses um, who were just surrounding me, clipping everything to me, monitors. I had a nurse constantly popping the saline into my eye to try and force the eye open. Somebody else pouring liquids into my mouth. My levels of anxiety started to raise. While Andy was in a critical state, Lee had a lucky escape. I received treatment for my injuries, which thankfully were, were minor. It was a lot worse for Andy. He's a tough individual, and to see him in that, in that way was, yeah, I was really concerned about him, really worried about him. But things took a devastating turn when doctors broke the news to Andy that he needed to be put into an induced coma. So at that point, obviously, your, your world just drops, doesn't it? It's like, wow. Been injured at work a few times, cuts, bruises, broken bones, stuff that I don't need to tell wife about, don't need to tell the kids about. But when they start saying medically induced coma, that's when I think, yeah, probably need to tell the missus about this one. At around four in the morning, Andy's wife Claire was woken by the phone call nobody wants to receive. He said, Please just tell me what's happened. And he said, There's been an incident, Andy's been sprayed in the face with ammonia. Um, and I just need you to come down to the hospital before um, we think he's going to be going into intensive care. So that's, I just panicked then. Claire made arrangements for their children and raced to the hospital. We went straight to his bedside where there was a team of people around him. Um, obviously they made way for me and I went to see Andy and as, as Andy is, he just smiled at me and said, well, I'll, I'll be all right, I'll be all right, you know. She came in, smiled at me, and shouted at me a bit. You feel safe then, because I know she's with me. Um, from that point, you think, well, I've got to see her again. It's so a worst case scenario, I'm going to be put into a coma. Um, she's had a chance to see me, speak to me. I've had a chance to have a conversation with her. Um, I tell her, after that, I love to bits. Look after the kids, that type of thing. Um, and then she was just, just calm for me. Later, Andy begins the long road to recovery. In a perfect world, I'd like my eyesight to be fully restored. And I've got to give myself that option. He's also thrilled to return to work and more determined than ever. The important thing was, get a uniform, get back out there and show people I can still do it. 
still to come. During a mental health episode, a man roller skates through the streets of Bristol, brandishing a knife. And when PC Lucy Sculthorpe tracks down an aggressive car thief, I need assistance. her police dog Bryn shows his bravery. He was absolutely determined to do what he needed to do. There's a growing mental health crisis across the UK, with the police increasingly being called to mental health-related incidents. Mental health issues in the community now are probably, is probably one of the biggest problems we have facing the police. You know, you talk about a nine-hour shift, half of that could be dealing with somebody who's having a mental health crisis. We get called out to a lot of volatile situations now, people in mental health crisis or people committing serious and violent crimes and we have to be there as quickly as we can. This is somebody who needs support, and our role, while we're not mental health experts, can be that supportive role. We can certainly be the first port of call for, for mental health. It's primarily it's certainly become uh, a huge aspect of our role as, as, as police officers. In February 2020, a shocking incident that highlights this issue unfolded when a man having an acute mental health episode went on a knife rampage on a busy shopping street in Bristol. As he waits at a bus stop, he can clearly be seen holding what looks like a nine-inch kitchen knife in plain view. But bystanders are oblivious. He puts the knife in his pocket before getting on the bus. But when his pass doesn't work, he leaves and skates down the road. The man is then captured on CCTV crossing the road. He stabs his first victim twice in the back and then chases him down the street. The attacker then strikes another man on the back of the head with a knife before stabbing him in the back. Another CCTV camera captures the moment a group of people courageously chase the offender away from the scene, and a motorist strikes him with his van. A passerby tries to intervene by swinging a road sign at the attacker, before falling to the floor, where he's then stabbed in the hand and leg. Police have received a number of frantic 999 calls about the incident. Two responding officers catch up to the man. Merrick, stop it there. Get down on the floor! Down on the floor now! Oh, no! Jeff, chill it out then, chill it out. Get down! As the attacker lunges at them with a the knife, officers deploy their tasers. The man is now incapacitated and can be arrested. The attacker was charged with three counts of attempted murder. He also faced three charges of wounding with intent to cause grievous bodily harm, attempted wounding with intent, and possession of an offensive weapon. He was found not guilty of all charges by reason of insanity and was given an indefinite hospital order. He's my three-year-old German Shepherd. I got him when he was 18 months old. And this is Socks. He's a working Cocker Spaniel. He's also three years old, so I got them both around the same time. Dogs were first introduced to law enforcement in the UK in 1888 by the Met Police, when bloodhounds were used while searching for Jack the Ripper. 
In 1908, the first police dog section was set up with just four dogs to patrol whole docks. And now there are over two and a half thousand police dogs across the UK. The dog unit is often referred to as dead man's shoes because it's a very popular unit and once people get into it, they tend to stay in it. PC Lucy Sculthorpe has been part of the Northamptonshire Police Dog Unit for the last four years, after spending eight years as a response officer attending emergency call-outs. Response policing is very difficult, especially now. Um, you're expected to be all things to all people. My job is to support them as best I can, and the dogs are there as a tool to help us do that. Police dogs Bryn and Sox have very different specialised roles. Police dog Bryn's job is primarily around finding people or things with human scent on. Stop running or send the dog! So he's trained to track people, whether that's criminals or missing people. He's trained to search buildings and open areas for hidden people. And he's also trained to find property which has got a human scent on it. So if anything's been recently discarded, he will find that. Bryn, out! Police Dog Socks is trained to find several different types of drugs and cash and firearms and spent ammunition. He's trained on all of those things. Hey, you're a good lad. Come on in. Police dogs live at home with their handlers, allowing them to form a strong bond. I do feel very protective of them. I look after them and they look after me. So Britain especially is trained to protect me and I feel an obligation to him to also look after him and keep him safe as best I can. In February 2021, police dog Bryn was put to the test early in his career when Lucy received information at the start of their shift that a car thief was on the rampage in a nearby town. A car had been stolen in the area of Cold Ashby we were told it was an Audi RS3 and that it had been stolen whilst it was left running on the driveway. The owner had gone out and tried to stop the thief from stealing it and had had their foot run over in the process. Lucy, her police dogs and colleagues went in search of the suspect. They received an update that an Audi was spotted having its number plates removed, something car thieves often do to evade detection by cameras. Whilst we were on our way there, we were made aware that an Audi had been dumped in an area in Corby. A PCSO had gone to that location in Corby and had found the car parked up with nobody with it. In the area where the Audi was stolen, rural crime officer PC John Hutchings made some inquiries. The plan was for me to go to the village and get a feel for how the crime had occurred and look for any other potential vehicles that could be around linked to that. John went to the village on foot and soon became suspicious about a BMW, which also appeared to have false plates. The number plates I saw didn't look right to the vehicle as well. Run the vehicle through, it doesn't run right, and I see a male run across the road. He's got in the car, and immediately the car is started up and he's pulled out. The driver was the suspect they'd been looking for but he was hell-bent on escape. Stood in the road, put my arm up, quite clearly identifiable as a police officer. Um, and all I can remember, even to this day, is seeing the front of that car lift, the engine noise raise, um, and the driver just looking straight at me. Peripheral vision jumped in. <laughs> I don't use the word jump, because that's what I did jumped out of the way to see the car going by. There was not a single sign of that driver slowing down. There was no single sign of that driver making any attempt to avoid me. It was he was coming towards me. As soon as I could, I called up the vehicles, made off, and not far from where this car had gone was a camera. Absolutely fantastic. Control room straight onto it, checking the vehicles within the last 20, 30 seconds. Bingo, full reg, and it, and it went on from there. Dog handler PC Lucy Sculthorpe caught up with a suspect as he sped into a cul-de-sac and she trapped him in a private parking area. I was nose to nose with the BMW and I could see a man 
at the back of it who appeared to be changing the number plate on the rear of the car. I knew that the car park was enclosed and that I'd blocked the only vehicle exit. So as I got out of my car, I got Bryn out as well, intending to use him to stop the man if he chose to try and run away. Bryn was already barking when he came out of the police car because he knew that something was happening. And I challenged the man to stand still. He ran and got back in the driver's seat and locked the doors. Get out! Lucy then switches on her body camera. Get out! Get Brim was also barking and trying to get to him. I need assistance. Lucy calls for backup, but with the criminal intent on escaping, her and Brin are in imminent danger. The gap that we were in was quite small, and I was worried that if he tried to drive forwards, that he would run over either myself or Brin. Stay there! I need help. He's just rammed into my car. With police dog socks locked in the rammed police vehicle, he's in real distress. And then I saw his reverse lights come on. I didn't know if he was going to try and hit me or Bryn, so I moved even further back. <laughs> the dangerous offender repeatedly rams Lucy's car until he forces his way out onto the street. I ran out and looked onto the main road, and I saw one of the firearms vehicles coming down the street who were coming to help me, and they ended up behind the BMW. After a short pursuit, the offender collides with a tree and makes a run for it. Yes, trash, 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 Moorfield Road. Moorfield Road. The officers track him down at a nearby house and race to the back garden. Shockingly, the offender is still trying to escape. Stay where you are! Stay where you are! Get on the floor! On the floor now! On the floor! On the floor! While he's detained at Taser Point and arrested, Lucy checks on the welfare of her police dogs Bryn and Sox. At the end of the incident, Bryn was very wound up. He was repeatedly barking, he wouldn't settle, he was angry. He had not been able to complete his job the way he sees it, the way I'd asked him to do. I put him back in the van just to settle, and then I got Socks out to check that he was OK. He seemed a little bit shaken up. He seemed a little bit disorientated, a little bit not sure of what's just happened. Luckily, both dogs and Lucy escaped the aggressive incident without injuries. It is upsetting to see them unsettled because it's, it's my job to look after them and protect them and prevent that from happening. However, they are police dogs and sometimes, due to the nature of the work that we do, they will come across situations that will unsettle them. It's, it's my job to make sure that that's minimised as much as possible and also to look after them afterwards and make sure that they're resettled as, as best I can. The offender admitted to a string of offences in connection with the incident, including driving whilst disqualified, assaulting an emergency worker, damaging property and aggravated vehicle taking. He was jailed for a total of three years at Northampton Crown Court. The ramming attack caused £3,700 worth of damage to the police car. I don't think it's enough of a deterrent. He was hell-bent on getting away that day, and I'm not sure the sentence reflects how determined he was to do that. The thing about this incident that stands out for me is the risk of injury to the dog. I not only have my, my own safety to consider and the members of the public, I also had to look after Bryn as well. On a more positive note, John is particularly proud of how his colleagues all worked together that day to catch the criminal. In policing, we all have our, our little niches, the things that, that we're good at and the things that we can bring to the table. And that's been part of a team, isn't it, really? Fundamentally, we're all police, and it's jobs like this that just show that we all come together and, uh, yeah, it's good to get results. Come on. Come on, then. Let's go. And Lucy feels police dog Bryn really earned his stripes that day. Brim was a fairly new dog to me at the time, and I learned 
about him, how determined he was to protect me. And it was the first incident, really, where he was tested in terms of courage and how determined he was to protect me and look after me and do his job. And I really saw that in him that day, that he was absolutely determined to do what he needed to do. And it was only the fact that I stopped him for his own safety that prevented that. I prefer working with dogs to people. They are generally more honest <laughs> and they make brilliant crewmates because they love being at work. They're always keen and they always want to get involved and they're just so enthusiastic. They're the best crewmates ever. Back in Lancashire, Andy Gore was in hospital with severe ammonia burns to his eye, mouth and throat after being doused with a chemical by an offender trying to escape arrest. I just said, you mean you're going to put me into a medically induced coma? And you're like, yeah, we're going to need to. He just smiled at me and said, well, I'll be all right, I'll be all right, you know. <laughs> And then over a period of about an hour, the, the tension seemed to drop in the resuscitation room. And he went, right, we've decided we're going to try and keep you awake, we'll keep you conscious, keep you breathing. And that was like a hoorah, that was like balloons going off moment in the back of my head. And his injuries were no longer life-threatening, but doctors were deeply concerned about the burns to his eye and moved him to intensive care to see a specialist. He explained the ammonia is worse than acid going in the eye, because the ammonia will apparently just seep through the eye membrane. And there's a worse case because of the fact that the ammonia went into my mouth, the concerns for the breathing, that's where the medical attention was rightly offered first, to the neglect of the eye. But obviously, that affects it long term. The doctors want to keep him in hospital for a few days, but Andy has more important things on his mind. It's my daughter's 12th birthday the day after, and there was no way on God's earth that we didn't have to be in there. That I was going to be there for my daughter's birthday. Andy was discharged with bags full of medication and made it home for daughter Izzy's birthday. When I got home, stepped through the door, it was just utter relief. You know, I'm happy, I'm home. I've seen my wife, I'm going to see my babies. I got home and they're there for me. Wow, it feels good. It feels good to have them around me. Izzy, now 14, still has memories of her dad returning home. It was just scary, the eye patch on, and pale. Just looked quite bad injury. I didn't know if you're going to be OK. Just happy to get you back home. What would you have done to me if I stayed at hospital for your birthday? That's the noise. Because <laughs> <laughs> it should always be about. <laughs> <laughs> the moods generally in the house when we came in, you know, children were very quiet. We try and protect the children as much as we can. But they could see his eye was completely swollen, an eye patch on, and his tongue was completely burnt out. He couldn't eat or drink. It was sort of every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day, that we had to put this medication in. Even though Andy has undergone four eye operations, he still has total sight loss in his left eye. But he has high hopes for success with more surgery planned for the future. The incident has also taken a toll on Andy's mental health. The first few months after the incident, I suffered quite bad with night terrors. Work arranged some cognitive behavioural therapy, which helped a lot in processing what went on. Just cleaning fluids in the bathroom, that certain smell creates a trigger and creates like a tingle up my back and a panic. I have quite catastrophic thoughts for no reason, quite a severe level of panic, um, which is just something that I have to just try and manage. And that's in the place where I'm right now. But yeah, it's tough. It is tough. Andy's attacker pleaded guilty to grievous bodily harm with intent 
and two counts of throwing corrosive fluid with intent to do grievous bodily harm. He was given a custodial sentence of 14 years and six months and an extended license period of four years. The female who made the original 999 call on the night of the incident withdrew her claims the next morning and refused to cooperate with the police. No further charges were brought to the offender regarding her accusations, and it's still unclear what really happened that night. It's a fair sentence by the court system. There's people who committed probably a lot more serious crimes that get a lesser sentence than that. Um, in terms of how I perceive him as a person, I've never seen it as an attack on me. I've seen it as an attack on the police uniform. If it wasn't me going up the stairs, it might have been one of my colleagues. Um, so I don't really give him any of my mind space, to be honest with you. There's also some positive news in the future for Andy's eyesight. The first step is to take cells out of the right eye. The second step will be to transplant the cell to the left, and then hopefully these will bring your sight back. Fingers crossed. OK. I haven't gone through the detail with the professor again. It's another two or three years of treatment, I think. We've got to remain optimistic. The chance is there that I will get my sight back in my left eye. And as long as that chance remains, I've got to stay positive. But though the road to recovery is long, and is determined to keep working. And after six months, he's back with a promotion to inspector. I think that's where he deserves to be. He's a good role model, a good representation of what an inspector should be and a good police officer. I was ecstatic. It's like, for me, the important thing was get a uniform, get back out there and show people I can still do it. Yeah, my first day back, was very overwhelming, really. Extremely nervous, but uh, as soon as I got through the gate, got to my locker, stab vest on, yeah, kit belt on, back in his own, back where I belong, and uh, here we go. And that was it, just ploughed on, 100 miles an hour from then on. It's nice to turn up at instants and, you know, show the staff that you, you still want the team, and you can still show them that you know what you're doing. It's that wanting to prove that I'm not going to get beaten. I'm not going to get beaten by somebody deciding they're going to try and hurt me. I think Andy's dealt with his recovery tremendously well. He's back working, still going out to jobs, still leading his team from the front, and it's commendable, really. I'm very proud of him. He's um, very resilient. He'll just move on to the next, next job, next thing. He's, he's amazing, really.
Thank <laughs> you.